A blessed Easter to you. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. That great greeting of the early Christian church on this, the most holy of Christian days, the most significant of Christian days. We're glad you're with us to uh, worship today. We hope that uh, what you hear is something that will inspire you to live your life with hope, with the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'd like to remind you of a couple things before we get started. The first is that next week we're going to start a message series that will really be entitled, Did the Bible Really Say That? We'll be looking at statements like, God helps those who help themselves. Did the Bible really say that? Or, God loves the sinner but hates the sin. Does the Bible really say that? Each week we'll consider one of these statements that's kind of accepted as biblical, but did the Bible really say that? A second thing I'd like to remind you of, and that's your support of the ministries of Trinity. We encourage you to give online or to mail in your offerings. Again, we thank you for so much of the support that that you're providing at this time. Uh, But we depend on that support to continue to reach out to the world with the great message of Jesus' victory at Easter. Let's begin today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let's begin with the reading of the gospel according to Matthew chapter 28, the Easter account. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took a hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And this is the gospel of the Lord. We now continue with a prayer as we get ready to hear the message today. Let's bow our heads. Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity to again hear about the hope, the hope of the resurrection and the difference that it makes in our lives. Give us ears to hear and we pray in that resurrected name of Jesus. Amen. A while back, I did a series of messages entitled, Never Waste a Crisis. And I really based it on Romans 8, 28, which is that God works everything together for the good of those people who love him. A few weeks ago, I was walking and I thought to myself, you know, Easter 2020 is really about that series, Never Waste a Crisis. Because what's going on around us is God not wasting a crisis, using it for good, working it for good. Let's dig into that this morning as we we talk about Easter and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Never waste a crisis. What is a crisis? There's a man by the name of Gerald Chapman who states this, a crisis arises out of some change in a person's life space that produces a modification. A modification of his or her relationship with other people and a modification of a person's perception of themselves. You think about that. A crisis produces change, doesn't it? Or at least an opportunity for change. Everybody faces crises. Some people get some 
tougher crises than others. Some generations face some tougher times than others. I think of the generation that faced the crisis of World War I and the Great Depression and World War II, and, and they had to be wondering what's coming next. I mean, even this pandemic pales in significance to some of those. But everybody faces a crisis. A time when, well, let's look at what the Chinese said about it. In fact, I'll use an illustration, uh, a triangle. The, the Chinese would say that what happens in a crisis is our triangle kind of gets tipped up on end and, and then we have an option. We have an option to either fall forward or we have an option to fall back. I want you to kind of think about this. Our, our ideal place is to be stable, right? A triangle on its base. But what happens when a crisis comes is we get tipped and, and there's a sense of being off balance. There's a sense of kind of disequilibrium. There's a sense of unknown and uncertainty, which leads us to kind of this fork in the road. We have two choices. We can fall forward to growth, to hope, we can fall backwards to despair, to business as usual, to apathy. Now let me point out that God is significantly present in the midst of a crisis. Sometimes we feel as though he's, he's not there, but, but he is powerfully present and acting in the midst of a crisis. In fact, what he wants to do is encourage all of us and move all of us to fall forward in the midst of our crises times. He desires that we would have hope instead of despair. What's Easter about? Easter's about resurrection. Easter's about hope. Is there any doubt in your mind that the timing of this experience that we're going through right now doesn't align with, with, with Easter for a reason? That, that God wants us to hear and to have the hope of the resurrection, to fall forward in the midst of this crisis? Let me talk for a moment about those two things, hope or despair. I mean, despair is when we fall back, right? And that really is the option that is much easier for us to choose, because of sin in our lives, right? It's an option that, that causes us many times to resign ourselves, uh, to have kind of a negative view of, of, of what's coming, to think that things will be worse than what they were before. Despair causes us to have apathy, causes us to have kind of a, a sense of giving up. No excitement, no enthusiasm, no desire. We just fall in this, into this pit, if you will. On the other hand, hope is growth. Doesn't mean that we get everything perfect. Hope brings with it new attitude. Hope brings with it excitement and anticipation. Hope brings with it opportunity and life. We see the future as being something that's, that's better than we thought it would be. That's our fork in the road. That's what crisis leads us toward. Despair or hope. Now, what's the greatest crisis that humankind has ever faced? What is that greatest crisis? The greatest crisis is sin, isn't it? Sin affects every generation. Sin affects every human being. Nobody escapes its devastating effects. Sin knocks us off balance, doesn't it? It creates a disequilibrium within us. It creates a, a disappointment within us. We miss our appointment with, with, with the life that we thought we should live. It, it affects us in, in, in terms of our mind, our thinking and our emotions, like anxiety and fear and, and, and thinking less of ourselves than we should. All of those kinds of things start flooding in on us, right? It affects our relationships in a negative way and, and causes a disequilibrium in, in how we get along with others. It affects us physically. We get sick. We age. We die. All of those effects are because of this greatest crisis, sin. 
And at one time or another, this crisis arises in our lives, either because of an illness or, or aging or, or death or a broken relationship or, or, or bad attitude or, or, or struggle that we have with anxiety or whatever, and, and it causes our triangle to be up on end, right? What are we going to do? Will we grow? Will we have hope? Or will we have despair? What will we do? What does a lot of people in the world do? It's kind of interesting to, to watch how the world responds to the various crises, situations that they face, as people do. Now, how did God respond to this crisis? God responded by, well, being love, the love that he is, and sending Jesus Christ, his only son, to die on the cross for us and to rise again for us. He faced this crisis and empowered us through his death and resurrection, taking away the, the, the power of sin over us, giving us this, this, this new life, this new hope, right? So that, so that we, as people, can always fall forward with a newness of life, with life everlasting. Let's think about the current crisis that our culture is in. I was reading an article uh, that was written by a man by the name of Joel Rosenberg from the Jerusalem Post. And he pointed out that 44% of Americans see this pandemic as God speaking to us. As God breaking into our existence and saying, hey, folks, you better pay attention here. Something important is going on. And that 44% is not just Christians. In fact, 22% of non-Christians, because of this pandemic, say that they have read the Bible, they have listened to a sermon online, they have listened to a Bible study online. That's one-fifth of non-Christians. Talk about God never wasting a crisis. We, we look at a couple of his other numbers. He says that 40% of Christians are actually looking at developing new habits or new skills in their lives. In fact, they're much more inclined to sit down together as a family, maybe because they have the time to do it, because we're sheltering in place, right? And we aren't running crazily after all kinds of other things. They're sitting down and they're having devotions as a family. They're, they're looking at, at God's word or hearing God's word online through a, a, a sermon like this or, or, or a service that's being streamed. They're doing Bible studies. They're doing devotions. 40% of Christians are changing their habits. Why? Does God waste a crisis? No way. 25% of secular people are looking at this crisis and saying, God is saying something to us. We better pay attention. And so we learn lessons at times like this. And they're life lessons. And they're significant lessons. And they change us, don't they? Because through crisis, God changes us so that we might grow, we might continue to tip forward and, and grow and, and have hope and have anticipation and have desire and have excitement for, for what tomorrow brings instead of apathy and resignation and even you know, kind of the sense that I failed, resentment and all that. Let me give you three lessons as we close out this message. Three lessons, Easter lessons, about how God works in the midst of crisis. And the first one is this. You have to read the last chapter first when you're facing a crisis. You have to read the last chapter of the story first. The last chapter of this story is not the number of deaths because of the coronavirus. It's not the number of people who've been infected. It's not what happens this summer, whether, whether we meet again or our summer's going to be more normal. It's not whether we have an economic recovery. It's not necessarily even about our jobs. The last chapter is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what we're celebrating today. 
It's he is risen, right? He's defeated sin and, and, and the ugly consequences that, that it brings with it. It's, it's the last two chapters of Revelation, the last two chapters of the Bible that talk about us as his people having the, the victory of heaven rising to life again because he rose on Easter Sunday and experiencing an eternity of joy where there won't be any of these pandemics, no more tears, no more struggles, no more hardships. That's the last chapter. Are you reading the last chapter first? as you face each day, because it makes every bit of difference to how you live that day. Do you live it with hope or do you live it with despair? Second lesson, and an important lesson, and it is that, that we don't have to get everything perfect when it comes to this uh, dealing with a crisis. I mean, in fact, sometimes crisis causes us to make some mistakes. What God longs for in us is faithfulness. Not perfection in terms of how we respond, but faithfulness. And let me explain this so that I don't encourage sin here. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, Jesus says this, Whoever is faithful unto death, I'll give him a crown of life. Whoever is faithful unto death, whoever has faith in me unto death, that's the person who receives the crown of life. That's the person who has hope. There was a funeral that happened. Mary and Martha experienced it. A crisis in their life because of the greatest crisis we all face, which is sin. The death of their brother Lazarus. Now, a lot of us uh, think, well, it would have been horrible to lose their brother, and they had, had great pain because of that, and they were grieving significantly because of that. But it wasn't just the death of Lazarus in terms of a brother. He was their financial support. He was their social support in a lot of ways. Their, their standing in, in the community and, and their economic stability was, was all built upon this man because it was such a male-dominated culture. Well, Jesus visits this, this funeral. And of course, in the midst of all the grieving, he encourages Martha and then Mary with these words, your brother will rise again. And Mary and Martha say, well, yeah, I know he will. And they, and they give some answers. And, and they're really right answers, but they're not perfect answers. They're not complete answers. Jesus doesn't pick at their answer. Instead, what he does is he says, Martha, Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes, he who has faith in me will live, even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. It's about faith, Mary and Martha. It's about faith in me and the victory that I win. I wonder what Mary and Martha were thinking on Easter Sunday, or at least on the, on the days and weeks that followed as Jesus began to appear, and they realized that he really did rise, that he was alive. They, they began to understand, oh, that's what he meant when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. You see, one of the lessons of a crisis is make sure you're walking with Jesus. Make sure that, that, that you're being faithful to him. I gave you those statistics about how 40% of Christians are, are trying to change a habit, build a new habit around devotions, around God's word, around worshiping and connecting with Jesus so that their faith grows through the word of God. Are you doing that? Are you seeking to grow your faith? Because it's faithfulness that matters, right? And a little sidelight on that. You see, when we're faithful to Jesus and we have faith in Jesus, he gives us perfection. Not our perfection, but his perfection. A perfection, perfection that ends us up in heaven forever with him. Third lesson. First was read the last chapter first, and I hope you're doing that each day. The second lesson, of course, was, was remember to be faithful and to grow your faithfulness in the midst of, of a crisis. And the third is this. As you take a step forward, you develop the ability to look back and see God. You develop what I call 2020 hindsight. 
when it comes to seeing God and his presence in your life. And, and there's a spirit of thanksgiving and joy and hope that comes with that. Think about that each and every day. We just have to face that day and do that day. And I don't care what's going on around us. We do that day with Jesus, right? We do that day with the confidence that, that we know the last chapter, that we know the resurrection, right? And then we look back at that day and we say, oh, there you were, Jesus. There was that word of encouragement from a friend. Or, or, or there was that phone call that I got. Or, or there was that activity that just seemed to lift my spirits. Or there was that thing that my, my child did that, that, that encouraged me about, about my parenting. Or, or, or there was that statement of love from my spouse. Or, or there was that person that I met on our walk tonight. You see, we begin to see with 2020 hindsight how God walks with us through each and every day. And that's the promise we have. You know, on that first Easter, the disciples were on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus showed up. But he didn't reveal his identity to them. They didn't realize it was, it was Jesus. It was only later after he left that they said, weren't our hearts burning within us? Because it was Jesus we were talking to. He really is risen and, and, and he really has given us hope. That's that 2020 hindsight. And you see, when we are never wasting a crisis as God never wastes a crisis, that's how we're living with that hindsight to know that God has walked with me through this day. And is there any better way to make it through a day? Easter 2020, I think more than anything else, is about God not wasting a crisis. He doesn't want to waste a crisis with you. And as you have your triangle tipped up on end, seek him. Learn the lessons that God teaches and live with hope. The hope of the resurrection. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Will you pray with me? Lord God, I just thank you again for this victory that you've won. And I, I pray that this world will know that what you have done is for our good that it secures our eternal future, and that when we put our faith in you, we have life and salvation. We pray, Lord, that this day will be a day that extends to each one of our days, each one of our weeks, each one of our months, so that we can live them with confidence and hope and desire and anticipation and enthusiasm, realizing that our future is better than what we could ever expect because you have secured it through your death and resurrection. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This time, Pastor Unders is going to turn to the scriptures again and read to us a great account of the significance of the resurrection. As we gather today, we hear from Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 as he again brings us the victory that we have in Jesus' resurrection each day as we, we go with him. And so if you want to turn there in your Bible, I invite you to join me at 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to be beginning at, at verse 51 where Paul says, Listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not fall asleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we will be changed. For this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility. And this mortal body must be clothed with immortality. When this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility. And this mortal body is clothed with immortality. Then the same that is written will finally take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory? Where death is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the victory that we get to celebrate today, that we get to enjoy, that we get to walk forward in our lives with each day. I want to invite you to, to join me as we uh, pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the incredible gift of your Son, that in Jesus Christ we have life, we have victory, that even in the face of our struggles, in our anxieties, 
in death itself, we have victory in you. We thank you for the great sacrifice. We thank you for the the resurrection hope that we enjoy today as we celebrate Easter together, a very unique Easter. And so we bring to you this morning certainly all the the struggles and the weights, the anxieties, the worries that are on our lives right now. And we lay them before you knowing that you are bigger and stronger than all of them. That again, you know the final chapter. You know what lies ahead. And in you, again, we have that hope. We have that victory that that goes beyond anything we will face in this life. You've secured us that hope in heaven with you. And so as we gather today, wherever we might be, whatever our Easter this year might look like, how it it may be different than what we'd want, Lord, we, we again come humble before you and we celebrate. We celebrate what you bring to us again this Easter, that your promise hasn't changed. With all that is changing around us, the promise is secure. In you, we have life, and we have hope, and we have victory. And so we lift our prayers to you together in the prayer that you've taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Again, as we gather today, we thank you for joining us. And we go out, uh, whatever our day might hold. Again, it's going to be a different Easter than any year past for us. But it is a great day to celebrate. And so we go with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Again, we get to go out with that confidence. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Have a wonderful Easter as you celebrate his victory.